Having one guest on a podcast is always an absolute honor, and I'm so grateful to have had all of the conversations and opportunities to talk with uh, professionals that are in the bowling world. But the idea of having four of them come together in one of the coolest places in bowling at the Holler House is, to say it simply, a dream come true. I'm going to keep this intro really nice and short. Mark, thank you so much for helping set up the location. Tom and Kathy, thank you guys so much for being awesome hosts at the Holler House. Parker, EJ, Andrew, Chris, thank you guys so much for doing this first 10 Pin Life Roundtable. Let's get in. Thank you all you? for coming here at the historic Holler House. This is the first time mm-hmm. I've ever been here. I think it's the first time for three of you. Yep. yep. Parker's been here a bunch. Yeah. It's not because I bowl league here. Uh, <laughs> I know yet. somebody's going to say that. But no. <laughs> well, I thought you sort of bowled league here when it opened. Uh, no, I, was, oh. I was the year after that. I, oh. You know, just, I mean, we got to set the story straight right now. None of my TV shows were on black and white. <laughs> that you remember. No, that I know of. That's awesome. Um, I just set my alarm so that y'all don't miss practice. But um, this is a thought experiment, to be completely honest with you. I have had this, prevail- this theory in my head uh for a very long time that you can sit down any any set of bowlers in any context and they can talk about bowling and it's a good conversation because um bowling is and actually gary talked about it a lot at the hall of fame dinner last Mm -hmm. week that somehow all and actually kirk and mary did too like we're all like this one big weird family and even though we have our little subsets and our clicks and all these sort of things um, we're all still bowlers and we can all talk about bowling. So this is, this is really just a thought experiment to see essentially where a conversation goes between four guys that are at various stages of their careers and, you know, different, uh, amounts of winning and all that sort of stuff. And to do it in a place like this is pretty darn cool as well. Also guys, don't be afraid to talk. This is just a tavern. You're allowed to talk. In between the- <laughs> Yeah. Right. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to start this off and kind of we're going to see if you guys can share um, a story about uh, a little bit of a unique question. What is your favorite moment from bowling on the professional tour that isn't a moment of you winning? What's something that stands out besides, you know, winning the TOC and winning, winning majors and, you know, hugging your dad after winning the world championships and winning player of the year? Those are all awesome things. But, but there's also a lot of other stuff that circles around winning. Is there something that sticks out as a memory for either maybe Andrew, anything that stands yeah, out? Yeah, I, I can start. Um, it was, it's going to be an overseas thing for me. Uh, you know, I always heard, like, Parker's been around the world so many times now, um, that uh, you you find that people will give you gifts, like when you show up in different sort of gifts. I mean, he gets a shark every other week for some reason. Um, <laughs> so uh, when I was in Japan for the first time and only time competing, uh, I had like these three, I mean, they must've been seven, eight year old kids come up and bring me uh, gifts, right? And I didn't really even open up. I was in the middle of competition. I said, thank you. And it was actually a couple of the coolest things I've ever seen. It was like a scroll, right? Of the map Japan, with Mount Fuji, the whole deal. Yeah. And this thing, I mean, like well thought out. Like yeah. what would an American want when he comes and visits Japan? Cause I didn't get the, I didn't get to visit per se. Yeah. It was a work trip, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, they made me feel right at home. And it, it was a really cool memory of like, I wish I would have spent more time with them now looking back on it, appreciating what they did for me. Because when I got home and I opened these gifts, I'm like, wow, this is this is so awesome. That's awesome. What about you, Parker? You've been, like you said, you've been around the world multiple times. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I have. But one of mine that sticks out the most, and it's got a, a story behind it, obviously, would be one of the appearances that I did in Japan. Everybody that goes over there, traditionally, they look for a Japanese doll of some sort. And typically they come in either a, I'll say a plastic box or a glass box that will enshrine it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my appearances over there, the gentleman that had hired me, gave me a two-foot doll in a 
two and a half foot glass case that he said, I'll give it to you, but don't worry, I'll send it to your house. Go to Japan. Are you going to send it? I will ship it all the way to New Jersey. He shipped it there, and I'm not kidding you. When it gets there a month later, you can shake it. It was jingle bells. All the glass had broke. Oh, no. So I sent him an email back. I said, unfortunately, it broke. He goes, don't worry about it. I'll send another one. What? He sends a second one. Gets to me a month later, six mm. weeks later. No. Shake it again. It's broke again. He goes, you're kidding me. I said, yeah. I said, but now, coincidentally, in a couple of weeks, we're going to Reno to the Masters. Mm -hmm. He hand carries it to Reno. He gives it to me at the Masters. When I got done there, I had to fly up to Alaska to go do an exhibition. I flew up to Alaska carrying this doll with me. And then from there, it eventually got to my house. And I still have it at home proudly displayed to this day. That is That's awesome. awesome. There was a lot of miles to get that one home. <laughs> That's so cool. What about for you, Chris? What stands out, man? Um, I have been given a lot of gifts, but the uh, the one that stands out the most is not actually anything that anyone set out to give me. Is uh, my second time ever to, to Japan. I feel like there's a lot of Japanese <laughs> yeah. uh, common, story. yeah. common stories here. Uh, but we were getting ready to leave. I bowled all week, and these three kids had followed me the probably entire... Probably three. Uh, they they, they, they yeah, followed probably. me around this, the entire week and talked to me. They found out I was Japanese, and they were just like, you're our new favorite. We're going to follow you around. So whenever I got done, I was like, you guys want a ball and ball? And they're like, yeah. So I signed a ball, and all three of them thought that it was just the one ball that I was giving to all three of them. I was like, no, you guys get one apiece, mm -hmm. and then I'll give you the bag as well, and I'll sign it all, and you guys can get it signed and whatever. And they started crying because they were so happy. And then, like – one kid started running around his parents in circles so fast that he ran out of his shoes and then started sliding on the floor. And I was just like, man, this is insane. Like, could you imagine if people in America acted like this when we right. gave them stuff? You right. know, and it's just like, that's the difference between like America and, you know, overseas because they don't ever get to, yeah, they don't get to see us, you know, mm -hmm. all that much. And mm -hmm. over here, we're very easily accessible. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. just a very fond memory that like, anytime I go overseas, I, I know how much they appreciate us interacting with them and spending time with them. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to bet that your story might be over in Japan too, because you do like going over there. I do love going to Japan. Um, the only thing, I have another story I want to tell, but for what Andrew was saying, like getting gifts, yeah. um, it's it's amazing how much uh, they pay attention sure. to uh, things that you like. Yeah. Because every time I've gotten a gift, they were like, oh, I watched this video and saw you like this. So here, like, they bring it to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like, oh, this is one thing that I get in Japan. I can only get it there. <clears throat> and they show up and they give you these gifts that you can only get here. But mm -hmm. they, they paid attention enough. They know you like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's always so cool. I mean, we could go on for hours talking <laughs> yeah. about, yeah. like, just how awesome the people in Japan are. It's yeah. just, it's amazing every time we go there. But um, there was a lady in um, Vegas. It was uh, a couple of years ago, maybe 2019. Uh, Natalie was out with me, and she had given us these little uh, stuffed bears. They're about this big. It's actually in my truck. And it's been in my truck ever since. Mm -hmm. It's. Um, she goes, these are for you and your wife. We want you to put them in your car. Like, it's to keep you safe. And there's been, I don't know how many times in the last year that I could have been in an accident somehow didn't mm -hmm. and like every time something like that happens i think about having that bear it sits on my dash yeah in my truck and has ever since yeah ever since i got to my car after she gets it. that's awesome so it's just something that's perfect savior yeah yeah, yeah. For so sure. it's just really cool that you know whether whether it kept me safe or not, I don't know, but I'm just going to keep it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I believe in it if I were you. Yeah. yeah. It, ain't, it ain't hurt you to believe in it so far. Well, anyways. Right. That's for sure. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. That's actually a good transition, too, because I think one of the other um, things that I, a lot of people, including myself, are really curious about, um, and Parker, I want to start with you, is what life on the road, on the tour is actually like? Because when you started, it was a lot different than what it is now. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but if you had to explain to somebody who bowls league once a day or once a week, right? Like, how do you explain what actually traveling bowling with the best in the world is actually like 
you know, whether it was back when you started or even today? Well, I mean, looking at where things started for me, I went out on tour in 1985. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll say bluntly, obviously, I'm the new guy out there on the road and I'm not sure what to expect. And my first trip back at home was with a, a guy that pulled on tour named Sam Macron. And we drove through a snowstorm, almost a blizzard, to get from New Jersey out to Peoria because Peoria in 1985, that was my first stop in February. Mm -hmm. But it didn't take long to realize that no matter who the guys were out on tour, and if you took the two guys that hated each other the most, if they were driving down the road and one guy seen another one broke down, he would at least stop to make sure the help was along the way. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they're going to stop to go out to dinner or, you know, catch up, uh, you know, down the road at the golf course somewhere. But they're going to make sure the help is there or coming and then they're going to take off. So it's like a giant brothership, mm -hmm. if you want to say, or brotherhood looking at all the players. Mm -hmm. Through that time, though, the things that have changed, obviously, formats change. We all know bowling mm -hmm. balls, conditions, all of that stuff changes. But mm -hmm. put all that behind you. Every guy is out there trying to do what they can to win. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what company you represent, because we've all got friends that are on different brands and represent different aspects in our sport. But everybody's out there trying to figure out, how can I become a bit better than I was yesterday? Mm -hmm. And that is probably one of the coolest things when you watch all of the players out there. Yeah. That was actually one of the things when I was at the TOC last weekend that I really wanted to pay attention to between filming shots was like, how much communication happens in a singles event, right? Like it's, it's so, I, I was so intrigued by, you know, you're, you're just shooting the shit with Sean as he's just running everybody over that second block. Uh, and, and it's just, like you said, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the logo is on the front of your shirt. Right. We're bowlers, right? We're having fun. We're trying to have as much fun as we can. We're trying to compete. Um, is that something that? Uh, and actually, Chris, I uh, a question maybe for yourself as you've gone from, as we are phone rings, I love it. I love it. I wanted that to happen. Um, you know, you've been on tour for a, not not a, a long time, but long enough to, you know, have basically risen up through the ranks, if you will. Is that something that you've seen change where, like, does, has communication between players become easier? Has it become more difficult? Is like, has that shifted the, the landscape at all? Uh, a little bit. Uh, obviously, my first couple of years out, I stuck with the guys that I went to college with or the reps that I was working with. And <laughs> now that I've kind of like proven myself a little bit, the more veteran guys like Tommy Jones, Parker, uh, they typically are more willing to help because they're like, yeah, I know that if I help this kid, he's going <laughs> to put it to good use and he's, you know, kind of making shows and, and we want him to succeed just as much as we want to succeed. Yeah. And they understand that, you know, the younger guys, you know, they're not, they're going to be on TV more often than not. So mm -hmm. we want them to represent bowling well and, uh, you know, be good, good guys for the sport. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Andrew? That's something that, you know, you, you, you came out of the blocks real hot, right? You had a year under your belt and then all you did was win. Um, and I, it, like, what was that kind of like from, from a competitive aspect? Like, you know, I have Parker kind of reference like rivalries and stuff like that, which is yeah. again, one of those things that, um, I don't necessarily think has, it, it doesn't have a presence that's big enough that everybody knows about it, which I like, right. like, I think we all kind of know that they exist. They are what they are, but it's not like you're watching WWE on 60 feet and 10 pins, which is <laughs> yeah. also nice. <laughs> Um, but how, what was that kind of like when you're, you're coming out of the blocks like that? And, and especially after you win the masters at, in 2018, um, did, what was that kind of like between you and some of the other players? Yeah. I mean, I was so new to it. I, like you said, a year under my belt in that year was really only half a year. I didn't yeah. get to go all the tournaments because of different reasons. Um, so my first full year on tour, I, I happened to do really well and it, I didn't have time to make rivalries, yeah. right? Like nobody was, people were still figuring me out, yeah. you know, and I like to use the word you kind of like have to feel out the temperature, right? Like, so it's still, I'm four years, five years in now. I still don't know when I should and should not talk to some people out here, right? Mm -hmm. When they're bowling good, when they're bowling bad, some are way easier than others, mm -hmm. you know, and you feel that out and you will learn as you cross with different people along the road that, uh, hey, when they're bowling bad, maybe not the best time to shoot the shit with somebody. When they're bowling good, hey, we can have fun with this, right? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, at the beginning, uh, I really kept to myself, you know, like, and as, <laughs> it's a doggy dog world out here, right? Like, as we're all 
uh, respecting each other. We are respectively trying to beat each other, mm -hmm. you know? So at the end of the day, we're trying to win first and foremost, but when needed, we do help each other out. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see it, it's not talked about as much. Like I always tell people that like for every one bad thing you hear about per a person, there's probably five or six good things that happen. It's just not in the spotlight. Yeah. And uh, that's very true for what we live together with because on the tour, we see a lot of people do really great things. Mm -hmm. And then social media, tells its own story. Mm -hmm. And when Parker started, there wasn't social media. So now they don't even get like really the bad. You don't even really know who they are yeah. until you get the personal experience with them. And one experience changes everything. So I tried to that first year to not take any of those experiences I had and hold them to heart because like, I didn't even know who these people are. Mm -hmm. And like, I had some good ones and I had some bad ones. Mm -hmm. And then I bet, I promise you looking back in that now, some of those bad ones, I liked a lot more than some of those good ones I yeah. had. Yeah, that's the cool part, I think, about the, this sport. And actually, one of the things that I love about it the most is how, at least since I've been around, how quickly it's evolved. Like, I don't know of another professional sport or any sport, for that matter, that has evolved that hard. And you talk about relationships evolving like that, right? It's like it, it, it can take 10, 10 frames or, you, or, or a block. You cross yeah. with a guy and he goes from a complete stranger to a really good friend. Like yeah. it, almost immediately. And I think it's one of the most beautiful parts about this game. And, and that pairs so well with the way the technology goes and the way that, all, you know, the, the sport has changed as we're in a center that was, you know, certified <laughs> and they're built in 1904, right? Right. It's a little, it was a little different back then. But um, the, other, the other thing about that is I, I'm, I'm curious, um, especially for, for you, EJ, because um you know you came out, you were you were on TV, what were you, like 19, your first show? It was 20. 20? Um, and I think from a, from a, 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 a spectator's perspective, your mental game has evolved a ton since then. Like, uh, you know, you grew a beard too. So there's that, Boy, but grew up, well, I finally grew up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting, <laughs> <laughs> but what would, but what would you say in, you know, the, the time that, that you've been out here is the thing that, that you kind of hang your hat on that you've developed and, and evolved the most, whether it's mental or physical or just knowledge. I think it's a combination of all of those things. Um, the one thing that I've, I've never lacked in my whole life is confidence. Mm -hmm. um, even when I came on tour, I had the, I don't know what word I'm gonna use, but when I came out, I thought that there was gonna be some week at some point in time, I would win. I, I just, I believed in myself that much. I, and I thought I was that good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, sometime I'm going to bowl really well. A week is going to come together and I'm going to win a tournament. Now, I don't know how many times I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. uh, did I think I was going to win 14 times by the time I'm 30? No, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think having the mentality of just the confidence in myself uh, to go out there and just pull the best I can. And then gaining all that knowledge from talking to guys like Parker, you know, sitting down, uh, having, you know, uh, I would have a beer, but Parker wouldn't, but you know, um, <laughs> no, <I'll> deliver. <laughs> but just getting, being able to, to have conversations with, with guys like Parker and Pete and Norm and Walter and all these guys that I, I watched growing up. And then the guys that are a little bit younger than me are like Tommy and Wes um, and Sean, um, Belmo, like, then talking to these guys about their process and you're just gaining all this knowledge and like, okay, what, how can I use this to make it work for me in, in a way that is going to make me better? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think sometimes when you're trying to give knowledge to somebody, they think that when you say that, it's that way. Mm -hmm. But people really need to be looking at it as absorbing the knowledge and making it work for them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of how my dad coached me growing up is he never really changed anything about me. He just developed it. Yeah. As he let me do my own thing and just developed it along the way and was just giving me knowledge. Right. And, um, he might tell me something. I'd be like, I don't think it'll work that way for me, but let me go try it. I'll go bowl 78,000 games. Cause that's all <laughs> I did. Um, and just play around with it and get and find whatever he said to me, find a way to make it work. Yeah. So, but then as everybody else said to uh, the other uh, friends out here, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, 
I made a post the other day. I had a picture from 2011 with Belmo. Yeah. Uh, that was the second U.S. Open that I bowled. I was a senior in high school when I took that picture. And it's just really cool to be able to do something like that, like take a picture with Belmo and then 10 years later, now we're really good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I did the same thing in 2008 or nine. Norm was bowling in Indianapolis, won the tournament, take a picture with Norm. Now we're 10 years later and Norm is, I love Norm to death. Like yeah. he's one of my favorite humans on the planet. Yeah. He's always funny. Um, and then to what Andrew said about feeling guys out. Um, and I can say this at the US Open, I had an idiot moment and I pissed Andrew off and it was my fault, 100%. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't thinking, I was bowling really well and he wasn't and I was just trying to have fun, but it was the wrong time. And, and I just, it was, it, it happens. Yeah. Um, but we can still sit here mm -hmm. and be good friends and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem admitting when I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way you can get by anything mm -hmm. um, is when you're wrong, you say, hey, I messed up. Yeah, that's happened a lot through the years. Yeah. I mean, there is not anybody that has any success out on tour is going to piss somebody else off at some point. Yeah. And when you watch what goes on and how it all unfolds, every single one of us has said something at some point or some time that somebody else didn't really take too kindly of. Mm -hmm. And it was just because of the heat of the moment or something right prior to that happened. And you didn't mean to chew out your fellow competitor mm -hmm. or your friend, and it better not be a family member, but it just, something didn't hit you right. Mm -hmm. And as long as you just take a step back or two steps back and within five or 10 minutes, because you don't want it to get too far and go, hey, you know what? Let me go go apologize. Let me uh, make sure I run into him and say something because otherwise, and I'm just going to use the situation here, he's going to sit and he's going to ferment over that. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to say something to one or two of his friends and go, now, what was that called for? Yeah. There was no and bleep, bleep, bleep reason for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all you got to do is go up and just, hey, sorry about that. And let's go right. on. And, and more times than not, everybody will respect somebody else for doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we're all in the game together. Yeah. You know, what EJ said a minute ago about the way that, that he grew up and, and what his dad may have instilled in him or tried to show him. We've all come down this path differently. Mm -hmm. We've all formulated our own road. Some of us have taken the interstate. Some of us have taken some pretty back roads and I'll go <laughs> some rivers to get there, you know? And we might not be too proud of the way that it happened. But at the end of the day, we've all landed on the same lane, right. trying to knock over 10 pins with a ball in our hand. Yeah. And when you give somebody constructive criticism or you have a conversation with them, and it could be about bowling, it could be about life, it, it might be about where we're going, you know, six months from now. Mm -hmm. But how they take it, what they do with it, is solely up to them. Mm -hmm. That's what, how it all shakes out. And that that's, I think, shines a good light on, like, an understanding of what, maybe the, the, ex, the expectations of what the culture is within the player's um on tour and, and you know you'll never it'll never be written down right the the culture is what it is you can't you can't put pen to paper on something like that um it's something that you learn or you learn it over time and it, and it slowly evolves right um so i'm i'm curious i want to start with you andrew since you, I, you actually have your least tenured player at the table besides myself who is at zero and you'll <laughs> always be zero um if you if you had to describe the, the the culture that is the PBA tour, I always just try to I just use the phrase it's a, it's a gentleman's sport. I always have wanted bowling to stay a gentleman's sport. I think it's it's shifted a little bit over time as drama becomes more uh, clickable. We'll just keep it that way, right? Um, but like you kind of said, if you if you just address whatever that issue is, whatever that drama is, within five ten minutes. Most of the time, 90 plus percent of the time, it's gone. Right. Um, and I think that's something that's a little bit more innate to bowling, but maybe I'm crazy. How do how would you explain the culture of yeah. what bowling is? I mean, I don't know if I have a singular word for it. Yeah. Like over the years, I've heard many different routes. Like as I as I'm watching Parker when I was younger, watching EJ right before I went out on tour making those decisions to to make this a livelihood. Uh, you're kind of like feeling it out as to a point of like, what is this going to be like, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of game are we playing? Because 
There's nothing that we're going to do as youth bowling outside of just throwing bowling balls that will prepare you for the PBA tour. There's just not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the intensity is higher. Um, it, it's just, a, it's, it's harder. Like I tell people, what was the difference between my first year and my second year? I learned how hard it was. Mm -hmm. Like, that's mm -hmm. what I learned. Mm -hmm. I learned it's hard. And then, uh, you know, you take it more seriously, way faster. But when it comes to a culture standpoint, I don't want to describe it in one single word. I don't want to like disrespect anybody, but like when I, when I was walking through high school, you had different cliques, you had different types of people, mm -hmm. but you were representing the same class or your same school. Mm -hmm. Like, if, um, like I wasn't really uh, great friends with the wrestlers. If somebody won the state championship, I would congratulate them. Mm -hmm. Bowling is kind of similar. And like when somebody wins out here, you're just happy that somebody won, mm -hmm. especially when it's their first title for sure, because we know how hard it is to do that. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge level of respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really felt a huge difference once I got that first one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt more like I belonged, mm -hmm. felt more not outside of the group per se. Yeah. The clicks, uh, as much as I didn't really, I wasn't friends with everybody. Yeah. But the clicks felt less like clicks and they just felt like people. Yeah. Um, so there's just a, a huge level of respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. As much as it's a doggy dog, you have the rash versus Belmo things, you have those types of scenarios. At the end of the day, I mean, when Belmo shot 300 against Rash last week, Rash was the first one to congratulate mm -hmm. him, laughing with him about it. Mm -hmm. So, and those are the behind the scenes things that people don't really recognize that are happening because they respect each other mm -hmm. um, because they're both great at what they do yeah. and some of the best ever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. We all respect each other to a point that everybody wants to get there. It's just some paths take longer than others and some paths are much straighter than others. Mm -hmm. uh, you referenced something about how those that first little bit, you're just like, you're in the middle of this whole thing happening around you. And, and you know everybody that's around you. Not very many people know who you are, right? Yeah. And and we kind of had that, you know, I, I, that's what I had at the Hall of Fame during last week. It's like, I know who every single person in this room is and no, nobody knows who I am. But Chris, I'm, I'm curious, do you have a moment or a, or maybe just like a, a, a tour stop where you really felt maybe like a fish out of water, uh, pun intended, shark, shark yeah. out of water? Uh, well, it wasn't a shark. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Got right. Got but me. like, was there ever when you when you first came onto the scene? Because I know you're, you're kind of an analytical guy. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're much of a bowling historian, but. Um, was there, did that ever bother you or was it just like, nope, I, this is just the next thing and I'm going to come out and I'm going to bowl. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny because EJ talks about always being super confident and I've never really had that level of confidence throughout my entire life with really anything. I've just always been like, okay, I'm going to keep my head down. I'm just going to work hard and then, uh, see what happens, you know, and whatever people say or do isn't really going to affect me because I've grown up with people that like when a ball rep would come in and be like, Oh, Chris, you, you know, I, you're bowling a lot. Let me give you a ball, blah, blah, blah. They would try to ride on my coattails a little bit to try to get that free stuff. So I try to just like do my own thing and, and, and let things happen. Um, but my, my first ever event was actually in, Wauwatosa, mm -hmm. where we're going to be bowling this week. And it was a player's championship that Parker won. And I felt so just like I didn't belong because <laughs> <Out of place. laughs> just like I'm trying to do my own thing. I'm trying to like figure stuff out. And I'm averaging like 210. So I'm thinking I'm like, oh, man, you know, 210's not that bad. You know, and then yeah. there are guys literally throwing plastic balls up the gutter, averaging 20, 20 or 25 pins more than me a game that are just crushing them. And I was like, wow, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> like, I thought I was doing OK. Some, and I wasn't even close. I wasn't even in the same bowling center these, as these guys. Yeah. And I'm just like, I need to get better. I need to be better i need to work harder yeah and uh and, and that's essentially what i did like i literally you know every, all the new guys are always like you know how do i get better i'm like you gotta ask questions like mm -hmm. that's literally the only way that you can get better because mm -hmm. we don't bowl 35 weeks out of the year like parker did whenever he was uh starting the tour we bowl 12 to 14 now mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and it's for four months you know it's 12 weeks over over four months so mm -hmm. 
you got to ask questions. You got to ask the guys that are knowledgeable and, and you'll figure out quickly who those guys are mm -hmm. and the guys that are willing to help you and be honest with you. Mm -hmm. You'll figure that out really quick. So I, that's all I did. I just asked a ton of questions and, you know, like he just said, try to decipher how that worked for me. Yeah, for sure. That actually reminds me of the story that you told myself and Larry last week when we were uh, standing at Riviera about Mark Ross. Mm -hmm. about how you know I, I don't know if you got to ask many questions that day when he was uh, oiling the lane for you but um i don't know i don't do you know i don't know if any of these guys know that story they probably don't. um it's not one that i've actually exploited out there a whole lot if you're comfortable you sharing know. it i think it's pretty cool because it shines a really interesting light on that that process of asking <laughs> questions and ultimately having people that propel you forward whether you intended it or not but well, especially at that time in my life, right? I mean, every one of us sitting at this table has been a teenager before, and you know, you, you think you know a fair amount at one point in your life, and you think you're getting smarter. Well, the summer I was 17, uh, and it, either 17 or 18, it doesn't make a difference. I got to know Mark Ross pretty good, may he rest in peace. Well, I knew he was coming to the bowling center one day, and I had my shoes, and I'm ready, and I'm thinking, he's coming here to see me, and we're gonna bowl. Comes walking in the front door and I'm already practicing. I'm ready to go. And he goes, I throw me a double. I go out there, get lined up. I was already lined up anyway. So I throw a double and I'm thinking, we're going to bowl. He goes out there with a spray can because you guys don't know much about <laughs> spray cans. At that point. <laughs> goes out there with a spray can and sh 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 cross wipes it and says, all right, throw me another double. Well, first shot completely misses the head pin. Get relined up, figure him out. Takes about 10 minutes to get lined up, throw a double. Now, when I say 10 minutes, bowling back then wasn't quite what it is today. So you really got to be in tune as to what's going on. And uh, so I get lined up, throw a double. He goes out there and does the same thing again. Now, it doesn't take 10 minutes this time, but I'm a little bit more in tune and I'm getting a little smarter as it goes along. This happens over a period of time, about an hour to an hour and a half, that he does this six times. Finally, the last time, he goes out there and cross wipes him, and I throw the double, and I do it fairly quickly this time. And I'm waiting. I'm thinking he's going to get a shoot gun. He goes, all right, hey, you know, you did pretty good today. I'll see you sometime in the next couple of weeks. i got to go back on the road. <laughs> and he walks out the door, and I'm pissed off. I mean, I'm thinking I'm going to bowl against Mark Ross, and he's gone. Yeah. But when I look at it, and it didn't take long after that, but when I look at it later on down the road, that hour and a half time frame was invaluable. What he taught me at that moment in time, can't put a price tag on. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he was coming down to really help me physically read a lane or understand what was going on with the lane. And no, we don't have the machines that we got now and, and the equipment that we got now. But the simulations are still very similar to what happens today. Mm -hmm. And the way that it went about it, Dave Davis helped me out incredibly, Mark and, and obviously Johnny. And, and we all know Johnny because he's still out here occasionally popping in on one of us. <laughs> so... Just say it is. It's, yeah, it's heartwarming. Yeah, for sure. Do you have uh, moments in your bowling career where you felt like you <laughs> you figured maybe something out that was just such a game changer? I know you th when we did the podcast, you talked about like learning how to bowl on TV and like using lower RG balls and that sort of thing. But what is there a, maybe something like that where it's like you had that that hour or something where it's like, man, this really hit, or maybe even a person that kind of helped you get there. Um, I would say the biggest <clears throat> the biggest one in my life was just figuring out how to bowl on TV. But as far as something like that, it was just, uh, it was been me and my dad Yeah, my whole life. Um, I think maybe the closest thing for my dad and I that really helped me get to where I am was the first year I bowled Team USA Trials. So dad had um, an old wick machine that, that didn't strip the lanes. So he, he hand stripped the back ends and on Fridays we stripped the whole lane. He had a, a, a stripper that stripped the whole lane, but mm -hmm. only did it once a week. Mm -hmm. So we go to team trials and bowl on these patterns. I, I bowled awful. <laughs> Terrible. I, I never bowled on a pattern before. Yeah. Like this was like the first time I've ever done it. Yeah. And we come home, dad goes, we got some figuring to do. Dad went and bought a new lane machine that he could program. Um, that's just the lanes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next year, I Team went back. It's really by hand. 
<laughs> well, no, that was being cost effective. <laughs> but, uh, he goes, oh, well, you're, you're not going to be able to compete against these guys unless you're going being able to make patterns. So, Ted went and bought a machine that we could put patterns out. The next year, I finished third and made some USA. Mm -hmm. So, that was probably the moment in my life that got me to understand that you can't just throw it over there all the time. Mm -hmm. You have to actually learn how to bowl. Because mm -hmm. um, I thought I thought I knew how to bowl, <laughs> and I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that was probably like what you guys talked about of why am I here? Like I don't bowl out here. Mm -hmm. Even when I showed up, I thought I did, but now I don't. Um, but went and practiced and yeah. learned a lot during that that next year, mm -hmm. and it paid off. Yeah, it paid off. So, and that's one of the things too. Like I think in that learning experience i think we all kind of find like a process right whether it's a practice process or our pre-shot routines like bowling is such i mean you guys bowled 40 total 46 games between that and the show right last week and it's just like there's so much you just lather rinse repeat right just just keep doing it and formats used to be longer they've done shorter ones all that how do you guys and Chris, since you led the tournament last week, uh, I think I'll start with you. How those four, they, 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 they take so long. This at Riviera is such a grind, pair to pair, lane to lane, even. How do you find it works for you to really stay tuned in, sharp, and not just off into la la land and then ultimately find yourself just throwing it right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, is being able to split up the time that I am focused on the approach and in the set to area, right? Like a lot of the time you'll see me either talking to somebody, talking to a ball rep, a fan, doesn't really matter, but I, you can't just spend the whole entire block just laser focused, dialed in. You just, it's too exhausting, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I try to split up those times where I have short durations of high level focus, and then I kind of come back and relax and try to reset and then refocus. Mm -hmm. It took me a while to learn it mm -hmm. because it's not something that everyone does, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of, you know, like this past week is one of the first times that I wasn't talking to people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like I said, I was keeping my head down and I was just focusing on making good shots, but anytime Andrew came by or you know, ball rep came by or whatever. And they were like, oh, how's bowling going? I talked to him, you know, have a little conversation. And then it was like a good little, you know, time away. So that way I'm not just constantly just trying to be like, all right, I have to focus on this board the whole entire time. <laughs> I can't, I can't look away, you know, yeah. and I have to watch every single shot or anything like that. Like for the most part, I can just pay, you know, be aware of what's going on around me. And also giving my attention to other places so that way I'm not just all consumed by bowling. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious what that's like for you now, Andrew, because, you know, you, your season has picked up, but it kind of started a little bit slow. And um, but I, I, is that kind of a similar process for you? Like, how are you it now? Because you not only had the focus process, but also a learning process with switching companies and all that sort of stuff. Like that's that's got its own innate things yeah. you have to figure out. Um, how, how has that kind of been for you? Cause yeah, I mean, I think you had a pretty good week in Ohio. Yeah. Um, um it was similar to him. I mean, you, the time you're actually spending bowling, doing the actual action of throwing a shot yeah. is like, I don't know, a 20th of the time you're actually in the bowling center. Like you're on the approach for seven seconds. You throw a shot for seven seconds. You're hoping it strikes every time like Fraser's did. And then you <laughs> yeah, get to go kidding. stand back there. You get to stand back there for three, four or five minutes. And you're just looking around. Like, so you have a lot of downtime in bowling. People don't really think like, well, I bowled for 10 hours today. No, I bowled for like 40 minutes today. And then I yeah. stood around for seven hours <laughs> thinking about bowling. Um, so yeah, so the beginning, uh, this, the first month for me changing companies, um, I'm watching a lot. Yeah. Like, especially I'm watching EJ, I'm watching AJ, I'm watching Smallwood. I'm watching the other guys on the, the staff, yeah. with what's working for them, what's not working for them. Mm -hmm. um, how do I translate that to my game ironically, right? Mm -hmm. And we keep going back to that. You take information in, Translate mm -hmm. to your own game. So the last couple of weeks, I've had to do that way less. You know, I'm much more confident in the idea that I have an understanding of what's going on with the bowling balls on mm -hmm. the lane. 
And now I kind of get to hang out a little more, right? Yeah. Instead of the beat your head against the wall, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. Moments that we all go through. Mm -hmm. like, there's going to be times you hit a bad pair and you have that anyways. Mm -hmm. But limiting that is huge in bowling, right? Because you really, at the end of the day, you should be tired from the amount of focus you spent on those few shots you threw. But you shouldn't be tired because of this time you spent away from the lanes. That's, I like that. You that's know, a, that's like a when you're off point, the lanes, yeah. you're looking around. Sure, you're watching, you're taking some information. But really, you're kind of just, I like to use the word chill. You're chilling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you reenact that shot again and again. Mm -hmm. And the repetition comes in. But again, it's only for like 15 seconds. Yeah. And then that next minute and a half, three minutes, it's really some visualization for some. Mm -hmm. uh, it's different for others, right? Everybody does different. I'm a huge visualizer. Mm -hmm. So before I get up on the approach, I try to visualize what I want it to feel like, look like, and then I try to do it. Yeah. And then like uh, some people are like really focused. Norm Duke doesn't take a shot off. I mean, literally he doesn't take time off. When he's off the lane, he, he'll stand behind the lane, look at it. I don't know what he's thinking. I, I want to ask him at some point. He doesn't even know. But he's like, he, he's drawing <laughs> the beers. The airpods that low is a little different. Than <laughs> yeah, hey, but he's I'm like. Not that far away from him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you are not your head of you, know? you know what I'm saying? Like, I've yeah. literally watched him draw a picture, like, with his hand yeah. as if he's doing something. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. What's going on here? But it's really cool to see how that happens. And honestly, I'm a people watcher, right? Like, like I go to Walmart, I watch people, like I see those YouTube videos. But while I'm bowling, when I'm sitting down, especially if I'm feeling good about what I have going on, yep. I'll start people watching. Yeah. Like I'll be six pairs over. If he wraps a 10, I get to watch him do the spin. <laughs> and like, <laughs> exactly. And I enjoy that because yeah. that's part of bowling because I do it too. I yeah. probably have some nuances that I don't know oh, about, yeah. you know? Yep. Um, but, I'll find uh, out. Yeah, yeah. We'll I'm, find out yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, find out. <laughs> I, I do the same thing. Like, if I'm... But either if I'm bowling good or bad, yeah, I sit down and like watch other people because it makes me feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think I think to a, an extent we all do that because yeah. it's a good way to like not necessarily laugh at someone, yeah. but you know, we're be like, with I've you. been there, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like yeah. so, for example, one of well, the things, that was me last week. Yeah, <laughs> one, of, one of the things that I do when I catch a bad pair, and especially if there's not a ball rep around, I'll. Walk off the approach and I'll do one of these where I'll just look and I'll be like, okay, he's 15 pairs away. And I'll just wave at him. <laughs> and I'm like, and especially like Kyle and Packy and Nick, they love it when I do that. They <laughs> laugh so hard because it's just like, he looks like an idiot. And I'm like, maybe hey, I do. Me, but both. like, you know, I'm bowling, I'm working, and part you of their job is to. Signal. Caller, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 like the yeah. ones. It's a little... I need one of the flags. <laughs> yes, yeah. oh yeah, like in Japan, they have they, they yep. have the flags on the center console. If like yep. ball return or something, you yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody comes down. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into the tournament director's office and said, "Do, do I owe more money for an entry fee?" And they'll look at me and they'll go, "Why?" I said, "Well, because." The only thing I'm missing right now is the dinner. I've got a full-fledged movie out here. It doesn't matter what guy I want to watch. It out. Okay? And sometimes it's because I can be bowling terrible. Yeah. You know, and I need to just look at something else here right now. Right. But there are times, like they just said, you could be bowling really, really well, and you're sitting in your seat, and you're, you know you've got everything figured out in front of you. Mm -hmm. But you're just sitting there watching everybody else, and you go, this guy's ready to blow a gasket. Yep. <laughs> He's close. Yep. Yep. So, you know, you, you walk in and you have some fun with it. But if there's one thing that, that has not changed mm -hmm. through all the years when you're talking about this, and it's been about the only consistent, everything else has changed except right here. Mm -hmm. When a guy bowls good, or let's say if a guy struggles, mentally, that's where the guys are tired when they walk off the lanes. Yeah. They're not tired physically, like they were saying. Physically, there's no guy out here that can't go 50 games in a day. Yeah. Because physically, their body will get through it. They're going to do what they need to do. And they know how to get lined up for the most part. But when they sit there and look at it, when they get done at the end of the day, oh boy. <laughs> you look at some of them guys and they're spent. They're yeah. tired. Yeah, for sure. for sure. And that was something that I kind of noticed that after that um, the first round of match play. So day one, because it was like all the transition was completely different. It was like, now that there's less guys and we're all kind of doing something similar, it's just, it was just a completely different thing. And just, you know, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's four or 12, 14 games, whatever. We can handle that, but holy crap, my brain hurts mm -hmm. for sure. And then one of the other things that you kind of talked about, Andrew, was time, right? That amount, because it's just so much downtime. 
but one of the things as a spectator that I think just gets thrown around and whether it's media or just you guys talking about it, I don't really know, is that the clock starts to spin faster once the bright lights are on. Oh yeah. Right? You know, I'll bold, you've all bowled on multiple shows that, mm -hmm. that and, and I, I'm, I'm curious as we seek to wrap this up so you guys can go practice and get yourselves ready for another show, right? Is how do you explain what that's like? Like, what is, what is it like when you've got, you know, a couple thousand people, I mean, you've probably bowled in arenas too, I'm sure, uh, that are just dead silent. All, all they're doing is breathing. And you just hear that ball return spinning. When I first made my first telecast, Coincidentally, in Peoria in 1987, mm -hmm. when we went out there to the TV set, we had practice, and then they turned the lights on a half hour before the show. And I'm not kidding you, for five minutes I couldn't see anything because they were so bright that I'm guessing at least 500 watt light bulbs that they had hanging from the ceiling. And you know, the ball center, the, the ceiling's pretty high up there. Mm -hmm. But you were walking around like this because you can't see a thing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you get accustomed to it. So the best way to describe it to anybody at home is, imagine bowling all week, and you're bowling your league. It doesn't make a difference. And all of a sudden, it's a beautiful Saturday morning, and it's about 90 degrees outside, and you go straight out of bed outside and let the sun hit you in the eyes. Mm -hmm. There's your TV show. Mm -hmm. And our shows were like that for probably the better part of 10 to, I'll say, 15 years. And then the lights changed. Some things got a little bit more subtle. And now, to all of the players' defense, it's it's a much better atmosphere to go ball now because you don't feel like you got that blinding light in your eye. Mm -hmm. But it's still even brighter and bigger than mm -hmm. it is ever is at home. Yeah, for sure. And and what I'll say to that is, I made my first show here. Yep. At, at the Bolero Montosa, mm -hmm. and the the uh, arena or whatever they have there, yep. the ceiling is. I don't even know if it's this tall. Yeah, it's pretty short. It was so hot. Mm -hmm. Because we were, they weren't using LED lights yet. Yep. They were using regular bulbs, and it was, oh my god, it had to stifling. Been, it had to have been eighty degrees. <sighs> yeah. On set. Yep. It was so hot. Yeah. And it's my first show. I'm already mm -hmm. nervous. I'm yep. nervous wreck. I, yep. I I honestly think that has a lot to do with it. You know, we we talk about our first shows, and for me, it literally hit me whenever I stepped up on the approach <laughs> because the whole night before. I was feeling good. I slept great. I had like 10 hours of sleep. Like you don't really hear about that. Like most guys are like, yeah, I slept like two hours. Like I was super nervous. I was great. 10 hours. I go through practice. I'm bowling great, feel good. And then I get up on the approach and I sit and I'm like, oh my God. Oh God. Okay. All right. Feel your feet. Feel your feet. And then I miss it to the right. And I'm like, oh my God. What was your first show? Uh, the Players' Championship at Wayne Webb's. Oh, oh, yeah. Was it 18? Uh, like yeah, something like that. Yeah. February of 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bowled Tom Smallwood. Oh, that's yeah. 21. It? it was. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. You uh, got you got the killer in the first one. Sorry, he's, buddy. He, well, he used you to get going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be fair, I had the opportunity to win, but I two four eight ten. Uh, well, so, you know, it happens. I, I actually bowled I, my first show. I bowled against Bill. And then coincidentally, two years later, I won my first title against Bill. Mm. Oh, so nice. which is cool. Like you bowl somebody your first time, and then you win your first title against the same person. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of neat mm -hmm. how things work out sometimes like that. But, yeah, I'm curious for you, Andrew. Not I don't know what your first show was, but I'm curious about the show that was in Syracuse because you talk about low ceilings. The on center might have been one of the highest ceilings y'all bowled on in the last ten years, and yeah. there was that place was full. Right. Yeah. I mean, my, like? my first two shows were something miraculous. My first show was a TOC. Uh, oh, in yeah. Riviera yep. For an 18. I wasn't in the title shit. I got through the regional PCQ and I make a show. Yep. And the Riviera gives you a different feel, man. I mean, uh, you can attest to this. Like, that's a hard place to bowl anyways. Mm -hmm. And my first show being there. Mm -hmm. And I had the nuts. Like, I had the nuts. I bowled horrible. I mean, I'm <laughs> up there. Literally, I go back in the middle of frame five and six of my ball up. Like, I don't, I got nothing. I got no feel. I haven't felt my hand. I haven't felt my hand yet. I mean, any tips? He's like, I would grab the crap out of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I would grab it. Uh, but the on center, man. The on center. Um, I wish they would rebuild it again for us mm -hmm. because I want to go back. But yeah. um, 
huge, right? Like, so uh, you bowl the whole week, and I love the settings where you have like plenty of room for wa- the bowling area, the actual set the area. Yep. I love when we have a bunch of room there because you can walk around and do all kinds of stuff. And that's shrunk on a TV show. Yeah. Like the comfortability level. Mm-hmm. As I was taking practice shots, I'm like, man, it feels kind of light in here. Like it's uh, it's shrunk. Like there's a lot of people. Um, but even more so when the like I was top seed, so I got to watch matches. And they were hard. And that was good for me, right? Like, I was like, low scoring, I have a better chance here, right? I, I don't want to have to go throw 10 strikes. And um, the thing I noticed the most about the on center is that when I looked back, when I turned around and you saw layers and layers and layers of people, at the TOC, you saw rows, yeah. right? So everybody kind of looked the same height. Now I'm looking up. Like, yep. I'm like, oh my God. Yep. You know, like, and that was cool. It was awesome. I loved every second of it, obviously. Uh, I can only imagine what Miller Park was like. Mm-hmm. When Wasman mm-hmm. won, like, I mean, when you look around and you see stadium seating, I mean, mm-hmm. and you bowled in plenty of those, right? Like, I mean, yep. as I grew up watching VHSs and watching what those seasons like, I think we have a fairly easy, actually, yeah, uh, outside of maybe some lighting here and there. But yeah. uh, I don't feel as consumed anymore by yeah. the amount of people or lights, mm-hmm. especially because I got by a couple of the toughest ones right mm-hmm. off the rip. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to i'm, I'm going to put you on the spot parker because you are the elder statesman of the table <laughs> no boy here we go <laughs> if you had to give these guys the a good piece of advice going into this week what would it be going into this week yeah or just in general either way well this week uh, it, it's got more challenges than others for the fact that there's a multiple number of patterns that they're going to bowl on mm-hmm. so you have to be extremely open-minded you gotta be willing to try some and like every champion that eventually gets crowned, you have to take that chance when you see it. If you don't believe in yourself and you're afraid to take that chance, you're going to be a middle of the road guy when it's all said and done. Mm-hmm. If you take that chance, you don't know what it can turn into. And you'll know if it's right because your boss going to tell you it's right. <laughs> but when you take that chance and it turns out to be something fruitful, wow, the sky turns to be the limit and it it can be that way a long, long way. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen, all very much for coming out, hanging out. I wish you all the absolute best of luck at the World Series. Thank you. Um, thank you. And hey, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Yeah. All right. We'll look forward to I'm it. Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Hollow House. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Tom and Kathy. Yeah.